China claims to be on track to land humans on the moon by 2030, North Korea's orbital launch fails, and Starliner's crew flight test is delayed yet again. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 2nd of June, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. Sponsored by Private Internet Access. China plans to land humans on the moon by 2030 and released more information about it just this week. Ahead of the launch of Shenzhou 16 this week, the China Manned Space Agency, or CMSA, talked about their lunar program, claiming they're, quote, definitely on track to put Taikonauts on the surface of the moon by 2030. This also included details regarding the Changzhang 10 rocket that will be used for the initial lunar landings. CMSA claimed that the country will perform the first lunar landing mission on the rocket's fifth and sixth flight, one carrying the lunar lander and the other carrying the crew capsule for launch and return to Earth. This indicates that the rocket will launch at least four times between 2027 and 2029 for the country to make their goal of landing in 2030. It'll definitely be interesting to see how China pulls that off in that amount of time, so we'll have to keep our eye on their progress. If you're a regular viewer, and if you aren't, why not? You might know about iSpace's Hakuto R lunar lander. The spacecraft crash landed on the moon on April 25th, soon after communications with the vehicle were lost. The investigation into this crash is now complete, and it revealed a really interesting software issue. The lander mistakenly thought it was landing on the surface when it was actually at an altitude of five kilometers. The investigation concluded that this was due to an error in the software that interprets the altimeter data. As it approached its landing site, the lander had flown over a steep cliff on the side of the crater it was landing in, changing the measured altitude by about three kilometers in the span of just a few seconds. The reading software wrongly concluded that the altitude data was incorrect and just decided to not rely on it for the rest of the landing sequence. So, with the erroneous altitude data, the lander just kept on going with its landing, hovering about five kilometers above the lunar surface until it ran out of propellant. Then it went into a free fall and crashed. Hopefully iSpace can solve this software issue and maybe other companies will take notes for their future lunar landers as well. Now, if you remember a few weeks ago, ULA rolled its Vulcan rocket out to perform final testing on it before its maiden launch later this year. However, things didn't go exactly as planned. Vulcan conducted a wet dress rehearsal, or WDR, on May 12th at Space Launch Complex 41 in Florida. After that, the plan was to conduct a flight readiness firing of the rocket's two BE-4 engines to validate engine startup and shutdown. However, during the rehearsal, an issue with the igniter system was found and forced a rollback of the rocket to fix it. Just 10 days after the WDR, Vulcan rolled out to the pad once again to perform this static fire test on the pad. Unfortunately, once again, the company found more issues with the engine igniter system, and the rocket had to be rolled back again to fix the issues. It is yet unknown whether this issue is with the ground systems that supply the fluids and power to the igniter system, or whether this is an issue with the system itself. But one way or another, it seems like Vulcan will be on the ground for just a little longer. Up next, we'll look at the crazy amount of launches that we've had this week, but first, we have a message from Jack about today's sponsor. Browsing the internet without a VPN is kind of like building a spacecraft out in South Texas completely in the open. Anyone can just walk up and see exactly what you're doing. Now I know, as someone who's watching YouTube, you've probably seen a bunch of VPN ads, but private internet access is by far the best VPN out there. In fact, it's the one I use and have been using since like 2016. Whenever you're using the internet on an unprotected device, an absurd amount of information about you is available to advertisers, ISPs, governments, and even potentially nefarious actors. A VPN, or virtual private network, hides your IP address and safeguards your online activity through an encrypted tunnel, shielding you from those who would want to exploit your private information. Anytime I'm traveling or just on a public Wi-Fi network, I'm aware that my connection is not secure. That is, until I get private internet access up and running. And it's very easy. You just download the app, click the button, and boom, you're protected. And that's not even the best part. Private internet access lets you protect unlimited devices simultaneously, so no fiddling with annoying subscription plans. Private internet access is the most transparent VPN provider. They never store or record user data, and they don't keep any logs. Plus, they're one of the few VPNs to support P2P file sharing. 
Signing up for PIA is risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, there's 24-7 customer support available. Click the link in the description or go to piavpn.com slash NSF to get 83% off private internet access. That's just $2.03 each month. Plus, you get four extra months completely for free. Two bucks a month is a paltry sum to protect your online privacy across all of your devices, regardless of platform. It's an outstanding deal for an outstanding service. So head over to piavpn.com slash NSF now. Thanks, Jack. Now let's go over this week in launches. Virgin Galactic performed a suborbital flight of their Spaceship 2 vehicle, VSS Unity. Takeoff under the center wing of the carrier aircraft White Knight 2, known as VMS Eve, occurred on May 25th at 1516 UTC from Spaceport America in New Mexico. NSF was there live streaming the event thanks to our own Jack Byer, who was able to capture the drop of Unity live and then the ignition of its hybrid solid liquid motor. Unity reached an apogee of 87.2 kilometers before gliding down to the runway at Spaceport America, landing 90 minutes after departure at 1637 UTC. If all the data from the flight looks good, Virgin Galactic plans to launch their first commercial flight later this month. Rocket Lab launched the last two Tropic satellites for NASA on May 26th at 1346 UTC from Launch Complex 1B at their own spaceport in New Zealand. This launch comes right as the hurricane season starts, so NASA will now be able to use them to gather new data that will be coming to a storm near you. This Soyuz 2.1A rocket, with a Frigate M upper stage, lifted off on May 26th at 2114 UTC from Site 1S at the Vostochny Cosmodrome, carrying the Condor FKA No. 1 satellite. The satellite was inserted into a sun-synchronous orbit and will be used as a civilian radar imaging satellite. SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 rocket on May 27th at 4.30 UTC from Florida, carrying the Arabsat 7B, or Batter 8, satellite into a geosynchronous transfer orbit. The first stage, B-1062, was flying for a 14th time and successfully landed on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions. The Arabsat 7B satellite was successfully deployed from the second stage and will now head out to geostationary orbit, where it will provide satellite, TV, and communication services to Central Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. This GSLV Mark II rocket lifted off on May 29th at 5.12 UTC from the second launch pad at the Satish Devarn Space Center. The rocket was carrying the first NVS satellite, which will serve as part of India's constellation of positioning satellites in geostationary orbit. China has launched the Shenzhou-16 mission, carrying the next crew rotation to their space station. The Chongzheng 2 f rocket launched on May 30th at 1.31 UTC from the Zikuan Satellite Launch Center in China. The spacecraft was commanded by veteran taikonaut Jinghai Pong, who now becomes the first taikonaut to visit three space stations. Alongside Jing was flight engineer Zhu Yanju and payload specialist Gui Hai Chao, the latter has now become the first Chinese civilian to fly into space. Shenzhou-16 docked to the nadir port of the Tianhe module of the Chinese space station at 829 UTC, concluding a fast-track four-orbit rendezvous sequence that gives the Soyuz speedrun a run for its money. With this launch, a new record was set for the most people in orbit at one time, with 17 people orbiting Earth on two different space stations, six on the Chinese space station and 11 on the International Space Station. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket launched on May 31st at 6.02 UTC from Vandenberg, carrying another 52 Starlink V1.5 satellites to Starlink's first-generation constellation. The first stage, B-1061, was flying for a 14th time and successfully landed on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. With the Arabsat 7B launch and this launch, SpaceX now has five boosters in the fleet that have flown 14 times. The 52 Starlink satellites were deployed successfully, bringing the total number of Starlinks launched to 4,521. Of those, 4,198 remain in orbit, while 3,542 are now in their operational orbit. One of the most unusual launches this week was an orbital launch attempt carried out by none other than North Korea. This is not the first time the country has attempted a satellite launch into orbit. It was actually the DPRK's seventh attempt, although this number depends on who you ask since it's hard to fully know the extent of the attempts made so far. However, unlike the previous attempts, this was publicized as a military reconnaissance satellite launch. 
The satellite, called Mali Gyeong 1, was intended to be North Korea's first spy satellite. The country has been preparing for it over the last few years by launching some of its technologies on suborbital missiles. Nonetheless, the satellite won't be able to spy on anyone or anything because the launch failed. The Choli Ma-1 rocket lifted off on May 30th at 2127 UTC from the Sohei Satellite Launching Station, and shortly after launch, photos were released by South Korea of the remains of the rocket in the ocean. It is now understood that these remains are likely from the rocket's second and third stages that separated from the first stage but were never able to achieve orbit. It is nice to see, however, that images of the launch were shared from North Korea to the outside world. The country has historically been very closed off to outsiders, and this small selection of images allows us to get a tiny insight into their developing space program. This week we had loads of missions leaving Earth, but we also saw the return of the Axiom-2 crew from the International Space Station. Crew Dragon Freedom, which carried the crew of Axiom-2 to the ISS, undocked from the station on May 30th at 1505 UTC. After a few orbits around the Earth, the crew donned their suits once again and strapped themselves in for re-entry into the atmosphere. Freedom executed a 12-minute long deorbit burn at 214 on May 31st. The capsule successfully splashed down off the coast of Panama City, Florida, 50 minutes later at 304 UTC. With this flight, Axiom-2 Commander Peggy Whitson now accumulates a total of 675 days, 3 hours, and 49 minutes in space, breaking the record, that she already held, for the most days in space by a non-Russian astronaut and any female astronaut. Despite all that time in space, Peggy says she's ready to go back up, so perhaps we'll see her again on another future Axiom flight. Boeing's Starliner crew flight test has been delayed yet again. That poor capsule just can't catch a break. This week, NASA and Boeing announced that they've decided to waive off their attempt at launching crew on Starliner on July 21st as they had planned just a few months ago. Representatives from both organizations explained that in the past week, they had discovered issues with the lanyards used on the parachute system of the capsule, as well as tape used to cover wiring harnesses. As part of its final certification ahead of its crewed launch, many of Starliner's systems were reviewed in depth. This uncovered that teams have improperly gathered data on the strength of the lanyards used on the capsule's parachute system. This means that the company will need to, quote, find a path to reanalyze the data so that it follows the proper certification needed ahead of the crew flight. On top of that, it was discovered that the tape used to avoid shorts on the wiring harnesses is flammable and will need to be replaced. This not only includes replacement on future spacecraft, but also on the one that was going to be used just a month and a half from now under the new discarded plan. Adding to these two issues, Boeing also found more valve problems on the crew flight test capsule as they were getting ready to load propellants on board. So, all in all, it appears that we'll have to wait another few months until Starliner is ready to fly again. Now let's have a look at what's coming up next week in spaceflight. SpaceX is set to launch the CRS-28 cargo mission to the ISS on June 3rd at 16.35 UTC from Launch Complex 39A in Florida. The Dragon spacecraft is set to dock at the station a couple days later on June 5th at 9.36 UTC. With the launch of Shenzhou-16, it's now time for the crew of Shenzhou-15 to return to Earth. This is scheduled to take place on June 3rd with the landing set to occur at around 22.26 UTC in the Gobi Desert. Another set of Starlink V2 mini-satellites are set to launch next week to Starlink's second-generation constellation. Liftoff is currently scheduled to occur within a 3-hour and 40-minute long window that opens on June 4th at 9.48 UTC. And that's your weekly update of Spaceflight News! Thanks again to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video! Don't forget to go to piavpn.com slash NSF to get 83% off or click the link in the description. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.